this film is part of our series on the topic of mediation, which has been called the hard problem of the culture war, mediating between the different kind of warring sides. And this is an interview with Matthew Taylor, who's the head of the Royal Society for the Arts in the UK. He's been advising politicians for decades and has been looking at this topic of polarisation for at least 10 years. He did a series called Polarised for the RSA. He also created a radio series for BBC Radio 4 called Agree to Differ, which brought people from different sides of an argument together and tried to model communication across those disagreements. And we had a really interesting conversation. We covered everything from how the political culture itself was almost designed to create division and bad faith argumentation. The way in most political debates are, are structured is not over trying to understand what we disagree about. They're about. It's about trying to caricature each other. And being caricatured is painful and it makes, you, makes us angry and it makes us want to lash out. And how to get out of it, we needed some kind of cultural shift. Now, I'm old enough to remember that 30 years ago, we didn't really have the same sensibilities about health, actually. Democracy is the same thing. We need a long-term process of changing our sensibilities so that we understand that every day we make decisions which do or do not make our societies more resilient, more stronger, more more capac more able to solve problems. Uh, and um, that process needs, it's starting, I think it's starting, but it needs to really be something we all take up in earnest. Matthew, thank you very much for joining me. You're the, the head of the RSA. And when I was, I've been looking into mediation, polarization, and these kind of really key topics that just seem to be getting more and more important. And I, I saw that you'd, you'd plowed this furrow really deeply for quite a long time. Um, and we'll get into some of the details of that in this conversation. But can you summarize why you think this is an important topic and where you've ended up uh, maybe 10 years or a decade or so after you first started exploring it? I think one way to think about polarization uh, is to think about it in terms of those factors which drive it and those factors which protect us from it. So if you think about the First World War, one of the reasons why the First World War led to such terrible carnage uh, was that defensive technology, that is to say barbed wire and the fixed machine gun, was much more effective than offensive technology. So basically people ran across open fields and got mown down because it was much easier to defend a position than it was to attack it. And I'd make a similar parallel with polarization, which is that I think that there have been two or three strong factors which have driven polarization at the same time as the kind of defensive technology, the the ways in which we might resist uh, resist polarization have not enhanced. So in a sense, just like the First World War was an example of what happened when you have unbalanced technology, offensive technology was weak, defensive technology was strong. We've got the reverse of polarization. Offensive technology, the technology that drives, and when I say technology, I mean the social technology as well as the specific kind of digital technology. The social technology that drives it is innovative and powerful and the social technology that that protects us from it has really not moved at all has not changed has has not been modernized so i like that it's a really interesting um analogy i think one that 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 seems to to ring true i mean what are you talking specifically about social media here or is it you also talked in one of your articles what I thought was really interesting, like we have a whole political culture that is designed around this um, characterization. And I think you, you also linked it to effectively bad faith or argumentation. We've got a whole culture built around bad faith argumentation. So how would you split it up? Sort of social media, political culture, what, and they feed into each other, I guess, as well. Yeah, I think when we think about what it is that's driving polarization, I think that there are probably three uh, main forces. The first, which is the broadest, and that is that people feel, many people feel, and particularly the uh, working classes of the Western world feel that things have not been going their way for some time. And there is some evidence 
for that in terms of a flattening in living standards, an increase in inequality, but also that those are groups which feel that globalization has not worked for them, who do not feel that the benefits of globalization in terms of economic growth and trade and the fact that you can have avocados in December compensates for the challenges of globalization in terms of the offshoring of jobs, uh, the loss of manufacturing, and often not so much the changes in the nature and the makeup of their community, but fear about potential changes in the nature of their uh, community. So that's the kind of big story, I think. Then I think you've got a, a second element, and that is uh, the emergence of people who are committed to increasing polarization or the emergence of a group of people who feel that polarization is in their interests and that partially includes foreign actors uh, you know we know the role that that Russia for example and some other countries have played in trying to ferment rage and polarization in in the west but also some political actors who have felt that uh, polarization, a tactic of a story which is that the people in power are corrupt and they represent one group of people and the reason that you're unhappy is because of their deliberate attempts to mess your life up. That core story of polarization, that there's been the growth of a, a political technology around using that argument, that core argument of the corrupt elite and of the wrong people being in charge. Um, so you, that's the second part is, is a number of actors for whom increasing polarization is their strategy. It is the way in which they will succeed. And then I think the third dimension has been uh, social media, um, which I don't think ultimately will necessarily be a force for harm. And in what, in some ways, I think we exaggerate it's well, we underestimate its positive elements, but there are nevertheless clearly problematic elements. Although I think when it comes to social media, we need to understand the kind of nuanced nature of this. It's about particular technologies and the particular things that they do. But it also, this varies from country to country. And so we have to recognize that there has been something that has been happening everywhere, but the thing that has been happening is different. You know, what is happening in Hungary is different from what's happening in America, which is different from what's happened in, in Britain. And to just give you one example of this, one of the particular problems in America is that it's possible to make money by generating fake news and extreme opinion um, in a way that it's not in Britain. You know, it's very hard in Britain to make money by being a kind of right-wing fantasist. Whereas in America, you can fund a radio program, even a television station. Um, you can get a lot of followers in a mass market. So, you know, in the end, Britain has been protected from the kind of far right because there is no kind of business case for the far right in Britain. And that's why when we get these kind of bursts of the far right, the National Front in the 70s, the uh, British National Party in the noughties, it, it kind of burns itself out because either you remain a, a, a sect that doesn't grow because you stay extreme or you move towards the mainstream, in which case you change your nature. But America's different. You can really be very, very crazy in America and make money out of being very, very crazy, whether you're an evangelical Christian or a neo-fascist uh, or, or a conspiracy theorist. And that's one of the reasons why America feels quite so intractable right now, because there's a group of people in whose commercial interests it is to drive and fire polarization. And you, you've you done a few uh, projects. You did a, a podcast called Polarization, or Polarized, I think, for the RSA. You did a series of radio programs on Radio 4 looking at actually trying to, to model the, the practice of, of conversations across divides, of depolarization, or at least, or at least kind of productive conversation. What what were the lessons that you learned from that? What are the key things, like practical things, that you think we need to mainstream or we need to, to promote? So I think my view would be there are an awful lot of interesting initiatives in civil society, um, as you would expect. When a crisis, a problem emerges, people respond to it inventively. And there are a whole lot of initiatives, commendable initiatives, 
which are trying to bring people together to overcome polarization. And I think that they tend to demonstrate that if you can create the right circumstances, it's quite easy to break through generally, to break through people's veneer of close-mindedness or hostility or propensity to 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 be vulnerable to believing in you know fake news or whatever it is most people the vast majority of people can be appealed to on the basis of a kind of common set of principles of 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 what's right and what's wrong and what's true and what's not true i think the problem is that all of those initiatives are taking place against the backdrop of a political system which still, uh, which is part of the reason we are where we are, and where it is still the case that not telling the truth clearly and openly, and not treating your opponents with respect, uh, is the way that things are done. And I think that, you know. I strongly think that we have underestimated the degree to which the ailing institutions of our representative democracy are implicated in the rise of populism and the growth of polarization. And, and I speak to you today with a really clear example of this ringing in my ears. So this morning, as I was running around Clapham Common, I was listening to Dominic Raab being interviewed on the Today program. Uh, and to put it into its specific context for people watching this, um, he's talking today in a situation where it looks as though there might not be a deal over the European Union. Now in the interview, his ostensible position is that the Britain is willing to compromise, but the European Union is not. But then in the interview, he's asked about the agreement that has been made with Northern Ireland over how that relationship is going to work. And in that course interview, the interviewer says to him, well, obviously, you have to compromise in relation to allowing some new checks between Northern Ireland and Britain, which is clearly the case. And at this point, he has to say, no, 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 we've not really compromised at all. No, we've not given up anything. No, 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 no. He has put himself in a position where to admit that he has compromised would appear to be a betrayal. But at the same time, in the same interview, he's trying to argue that Britain is not to blame if there's a no deal because we have tried to compromise. And it is, he is therefore in a completely impossible position because he's in a position where to compromise is totally illegitimate, but yet how can you enter into negotiations if you're not willing to compromise? And therefore in order to be able to demonstrate that he is entering into the negotiations in good faith, he has to say he's willing to negotiate. So for me, this captured everything. It captured everything. Because actually what he as a grown up politician should be saying is, of course, if you enter into negotiations, you're going to have to compromise. Of course, when we as a country agreed to Brexit and demanded Brexit, we were going to have to end up making very difficult decisions. And we're not going to get everything we want. But he's incapable of saying that. And so this conversation is, is one which absolutely exemplifies the way in which our mainstream politicians have boxed themselves into a corner. And in that corner, populists thrive because they have no problem with such contradictions. They have no problem with asserting on the one hand that they're going to negotiate. On the other hand, they'll never have to compromise. This is, this is Trumpism. In, in, in Trump land, Farage land, you don't need to make sense, right? So the problem is that the people who should be making sense of a, have stopped doing it. The people who should be telling the truth of not doing it, the people who should be explaining to us the challenges that we face aren't doing it. So if you're gonna be in a world of mythology, dishonesty, disingenuity, well, you may as well do it properly with a populist. And is that something that the media is complicit in as well? There's this sort of gotcha game that's being played by the media that seems to be a kind of um, part of the pro of this sort of decline of honesty. And um, do you do you think that there's that's the other side of this? I think that the non-social media, as it were, the mainstream media, 
there are two parts to this. There's a bit. There's bits of the mainstream media, you know, like, you know, and I say this as a, a person on the left. I think the Guardian sometimes guilty of it as well. But you know, I, I, I guess I would identify the Mail and the Telegraph and the Sun traditionally as newspapers that have been very, very willing to encourage the public to feel that they are victims of corrupt, venal, conspiratorial politicians um, and to drive public fear and pessimism. But in a sense, that's how it's always been. Uh, and I don't think much is going to change. And of course, a lot fewer people read those newspapers now. But I also think that the kind of the mainstream media that sees itself as more responsible is also to blame to a certain extent. I think that it is still the way in which news programmes are constructed is to try to make the argument as lively as possible because that's what gets people interested. I have found it very difficult. It is starting to change now, but I have found it incredibly difficult to get the media interested in deliberative democracy because as more than one producer or commissioner has said to me, people sitting around a table having a civilised conversation agreeing with each other is really boring. Um, so I think that the, all parts of the media, on the one hand, it's the same really as, as, as the, the, the issue of polarisation. On the one hand, you've got the people driving polarisation. But on the other hand, you've got the responsibilities of those who are seeking to guard us against polarisation. And I think that we have not done nearly as effectively as we could in relation to the latter. And there is, yes, a folly à deux between politicians and journalists um, in which they both blame each other for a situation which is continuing to deteriorate. And I, I wonder, there are a couple of things that you mentioned that you think are kind of central, central to mediation or central to kind of overcoming disagreement, one of which is the mischaracterization of other perspectives. Like the, that actually one of the processes that people need to do is to agree on what they disagree about first. Can you talk about that? In mediation processes, one of the methods that's used often, and this is in kind of conflict situations, armed conflict situations sometimes, is a process of getting people to agree what they disagree about. And that's really important. And the reason it's important is because the way in most political debates are structured is not over trying to understand what we disagree about they're about it's about trying to caricature each other and being caricatured is painful and it makes you makes us angry and it makes us want to lash out so that the structure of a normal political conversation would be if you and i were on the today program i would say i believe in fairness whereas david you know is committed to unfairness to which you would respond, no, I am committed to fairness. Matthew Taylor is well known to be, a, you know, to be somebody who favours unfairness. The listener, unless they're very informed, merely has to, that has to make a judgment based on whether they think you're a more attractive person than I am, right? There's no basis for adjudicating this because it's simply a set of assertions that are thrown around, right? Now, actually, the interesting conversation to have is, well, David, what do you mean by fairness? T tell me what you mean by it, and I'll tell you what I mean by it. And then, OK, actually, it turns out we agree about half this stuff, but we can now identify the thing we don't agree about. We can identify the fact that you think that fairness means that inequality is reduced throughout people's lives, Whereas I think fairness is just about making sure that people start off from the same point of view. So I believe in starting starting gate fairness. You believe in fairness throughout life. And we say, OK, well, that's good. Now you no longer feel threatened. I don't feel threatened. We can have a conversation about the relative ver mer merits of our, of our different positions. Because I'm not saying you believe in unfairness. I'm just saying you believe in a different account of fairness to my account of fairness. Well, let's discuss that. And as we discuss it, we will probably realise that there are some strengths to my argument, some strengths to your argument, and it's fine. And so, but it's very, very rare for that to happen. Now, I did do a Radio 4 series, which was called Agree to Differ. Oh, I tried to do that. And it didn't work. And I, I think it didn't work for two reasons. It didn't work because I, I'm not a good enough presenter. 
Um, and it's now been presented by Anne McElvoy, who's much better than me, and she's doing a slightly different version of it, which works much better. But it also didn't work, and this is another thing that Anne McElvoy's version of it is better at, it didn't work because the funny thing was, I put two people in a room together for 45 minutes who were passionately opposed to each other. You know, within 10 minutes, they were agreeing with each other. I mean, the programme didn't really work because actually when you get people together and you say, I want you to behave in a civilised way towards each other and I want you to work with each other to agree what you disagree about, all this kind of hostile... I had, on my programme, I had somebody who was one of the original founders, the, uh, the, invented the idea of animal rights. One of the people who invented the idea of animal rights was somebody who was a well-known vivisectionist. And actually, the, the, the first person had been on demos uh, focused towards the second person. Again, within about 10 or 15 minutes, they kind of more or less agreed. They had a couple of things they disagreed about, but they more or less agreed. And so we've got an enormous structure here, which which is actually designed in the media, in politics, to, to make people look as though they disagree more passionately than they actually do. And I also think that feeds into a psychological thing, David, which is this, which is that if I've got a set of opinions about which I'm not entirely certain, it is easier for me to get into a conversation when I caricature you as being an idiot or evil or driven by the wrong motives than it is for me to actually listen to you and ask myself whether or not you might be right and I might have to change my view. So psychologically, the media and politicians are tapping into the fact that when we face cognitive dissonance, we'd rather believe that we feel differently to other people because the other people are bad than to have to ask ourselves, well, hang on, this seems this person who disagrees with me seems like a decent person. Maybe I should listen to them. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective. We were talking about this the other day and someone said an addiction to certainty. There's this kind of addiction to certainty. And I think you're right. It comes from this sort of maybe in the back of our minds being a little bit concerned that we don't have all the answers or we're not entirely sure. What You, you talked about this just for the last question. You talked about this structure can you can you outline what you mean by this structure? Is it is it wanting is it sort of wanting to make every TV debate as sexy as possible to maximize disagreement? Is it because these these kind of tactics work? What is the nature of the structure and how do you tackle that? So I think fundamentally that democracy is based upon uh, a, a set of ideas which may well have been very important ideas when democracy was the new kid on the block in the modern world. Of course, it goes back to ancient Greece, but in the modern world. And it was an alternative to absolutism. And I, there, I think, you know, the importance of allowing conflict, allowing differences of opinion, of having a strong opposition to hold the government to account, of the press there to challenge the authority of people who might be making decisions without properly consulting and opening. Now, don't get me wrong, none of that is unnecessary. All of that is necessary. But I think that it, it also makes assumptions about human beings which are, which, are, which are partial. So for example, there's the assumption that when people have an opinion, their opinion is fixed. Well, that's not true. Most of the opinions we have, particularly about things outside our own day-to-day -day lives, are not fixed at all. So if I conduct an opinion poll and I ask people about, I don't know, criminal justice, I'll get one set of answers. If the same group of people then spend two days in a citizen's assembly and listen to evidence and talk to other people, they'll come to very different kinds of conclusions. But, you know, in politics, we kind of treat opinion as though it's sovereign, even though actually it's, it's fungible, it, it, it moves around. Um, and then equally, we underestimate the degree to which human beings faced with the possibility of having to change their mind will, if they possibly can, revert to a view which says, I will stay with what I believe and find a way of othering the person who disagrees with me. And that, that is a natural human tendency that the democracy has got to find a way of guarding against. So I think we need to renew our democracy by saying that as well as those characteristics which we particularly emphasized because democracy was there to, uh, to, to tackle absolutist power, we need a similar set of institutions, of norms, of psychological insights 
which recognise that society cannot work unless people have a reasonable degree of shared values and particularly a, a reasonably strong set of shared values about how it is you go about the business of disagreeing with each other and resolving those disagreements. And I think this whole set of questions about how you do that and what institutions you need, we just don't think about it. And so what you see as politicians every day, inadvertently often adding to the difficulties of how it is we as a society in a complex, a diverse society, a complex world, resolve problems. And we need to get to a point where it's almost like the analogy I'd use is, is with health. So when it comes to health, I know that if I eat a donut, it's not great for my health. I might choose to do it sometimes, but it's not great for my health. I know if I eat carrots, it's good for my health. And that isn't just something I know about donuts and carrots. That's something I know about almost everything in my life. It's healthier to walk than it is to drive. You know, it's healthier to be slim than it is to be overweight. So actually, I know as I go through my day-to-day -day life that I make a set of decisions where there's all there's a there's a healthier or less healthy option, right? And I make my judgment as a grown-up autonomous individual. We almost need the same sensibility about how we as a society live together resolve issues together. We need to be similarly aware as we go through our day-to-day -day life that there are decisions we make which can make it more likely that we can participate in a society that is able to live together and solve its problems together. And there are decisions I can make that will make it harder. And, you know, if I go on social media and I retweet something that's poisonous that I haven't even read, well, that's, you know, the democratic equivalent of eating 10 donuts. You know, if I cultivate the habit of listening to people more carefully well that's the equi democratic equivalent of me you know going to the gym and just as in health we particularly observe people in power so we would be particularly concerned wouldn't we if we had a secretary of state for health who was often to be seen munching donuts and was never to be seen uh doing anything to keep fit similarly with a democratic sensibility we would look at our politicians and we would expect them even more to continuously ask themselves whether their behaviour is behaviour more likely to contribute to social resilience and our capacity to live together and resolve issues or whether it was more likely to make that harder. That's what we need. Now, I'm old enough to remember that 30 years ago, we didn't really have the same sensibilities about health, actually. You know, as I was growing up, I didn't really monitor the world and think is that healthy or not i'm just going to do whatever i wanted to do and i wasn't really very fit and then that's really changed and our consciousness has shifted and we're all much more aware of this and as a consequence over the long term we will become healthier democracy is the same thing we need a long-term process of changing our sensibilities so that we understand that every day we make decisions which do or do not make our societies more resilient more stronger more more capacity more able to solve problems uh, and um, that process needs, it's starting, I think it's starting, but it needs to really be something we all take up in earnest, because the forces of polarization and division are very powerful, and we have got to start strengthening ourselves. It's just like food, again, just like we're surrounded by adverts encouraging us to do unhealthy things, so we need to become, exercise our own muscles so that we resist all of that. So our democratic sensibilities need to enable us to resist those forces which are driving us apart from each other. Great. Beautiful call to arms at the end. Thank you, Matthew. Great. Nice to talk to you. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho hamilton John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>